Naruwe Hospitals, promoted by the Sanko Foundation, is the brainchild of the founder chairman Dr. G.V. Sampath. Belonging to Velo, the medical hub of India, Dr. Sampath's vision to create a medical destination for the people of Velo in particular and others from India at large and also overseas resulted in the establishment of a hospital here, a real crown jewel in the field of healthcare. Large numbers of people belonging to Velo and the surrounding districts have been known to travel to Chennai and Bengaluru, both nearly 200 kilometers away from Velo, seeking medical care due to the dearth of facilities and the hardships faced by the locals to access available services. As per the vision of the chairman, the best in healthcare, both in terms of medical and nursing professionals, as well as sophistication, were infused into the institution, making sure that patient affordability was addressed at all times. Less than a month after Naruvi Hospitals opened its doors to the public, the second wave of COVID loomed large as life. We took on the challenge and quickly rose to the occasion, catering to the local population and some from outstation as well, adding close to 40 critical care beds and over 200 ward beds to the COVID care pool. Much as it was hard for a one-month-old hospital to handle such large volumes of very sick patients, Naruvi Hospitals was able to contribute significantly in our country's efforts to save people from the disastrous end that COVID was driving people to. Naruvi Hospitals is positioned as a high-end tertiary care centre. Our focus on ethics, transparency, patient satisfaction and an academic outlook in everything we do ensures that doctors, nurses and others in the care team are performing at their conscientious best to not only treat patients' ailments but also to make them happy overall when they leave our hospital. We have tied up with the Henry Ford Health System, HFHS, based out of Michigan State in the United States of America. HFHS is one of the old and leading healthcare delivery systems in Midwestern America. The main aim of this tie-up is to have constant transfer of knowledge and to get access to the time-tested practices they have been following for decades, which ultimately translated to patient care. Naruvi Hospitals is a completely paperless and filmless hospital. The Naruvi philosophy of care is embodied by our motto, Fragrance of Care. The doctors in Naruvi are largely trained in the best of medical institutes in India and come with years of rich experience in their fields of expertise. With the philosophy and its pallbearers, the medical and nursing professionals, the high-end equipment and the building infrastructure complete the holistic picture of fragrance of care. The hospital is 475 bedded with a 25% critical care bed count. Naruvi Hospitals boasts of an over 5 lakh square foot building spanning 14 levels. The building is completely air conditioned, conforming to ASHRAE standards with zone specific air conditioning to reduce cross infection between different care areas. Our laundry is 100% barrier washed. We have a top of the line sterilization department with machines with 95% water saving machines, saving up to 300 liters of water every running hour. We have all the major medical and surgical specialties. There are 16 modular operation theatres with laminar airflow. All the equipment in the ICUs and OTs are pendant mount to avoid clutter on the floor. All the departments are equipped to the most modern standards with the best and latest equipment so as to be able to provide the best end-to-end -end treatment to our patients. State-of-the-art cardiac cath labs, the latest robotic hybrid OT, ECMO, interventional pulmonology, high-end orthopedics, general and bariatric surgery, epilepsy monitoring unit with robot-guided epilepsy surgery, neuromonitoring, navigation, the latest lithotripter, urology laser are just some of the arrows in our quiver. Our primary focus, though being the local Velo people and Indians at large, we are working towards attracting overseas patients as well. We have started an office in North Sudan in Khartoum. We are in the process of tying up with the garments of Oman and Seychelles as well. In all, Naruvi Hospitals is more than a hospital. It is an experience.
Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to another edition of the Hindus Wellness series of webinars. This edition of the webinar is presented with Aruvi Hospitals, and we are going to discuss a very important topic today, which is asthma in children and everything that we need to know about that. So, thank you once again for joining us on this Sunday morning. Um, let me uh, introduce the topic for the day. Uh, according to the World Health Organization, Asthma is the major non-communicable disease affecting both children and adults, and it is the most common chronic disease, particularly among children. And according to a Lancet study conducted in 29, asthma affected an estimated 26 crore people and caused around 4.5 lakh deaths across the world. And the effect of this disease is particularly pronounced in lower and middle income countries due to difficulties in getting right access to the health care. Today, we have three eminent panelists from Narubi Hospital and also from our neighboring country of Nepal to enlighten us on this topic. So let me take the pleasure of introducing all the panelists to our viewers. We have with us Dr. Vijay Kumar, who is consultant, pediatric pulmonology and intensive care at Narubi Hospitals. He has around 10 years of experience in pediatrics. He did his MD pediatrics from the prestigious All India Institute of Medical Sciences in Delhi. He has also completed DM in pediatric pulmonology and intensive care. Welcome to this discussion, doctor. Thank you. Then we have Dr. Sonia Mary Kurian, who is heading the pediatrics department at Naruvi Hospitals in Velu. Dr. Sonia is the head of the pediatrics at Naruvi Hospital. She has over 20 years of experience in pediatrics and neonatology. She has done her diploma in allergy, asthma in, from CMC Velour Hospital. She has completed her postgraduate training in Kasturba Medical College, Mangalore, and Kote Medical College in Kerala. She has worked abroad in the United Kingdom as well. It's a pleasure to have you today with us, doctor. Welcome to the discussion. Good morning. Thank you very much. Yeah. Let me also take the pleasure of inviting Dr. Jagat Jeevan Gimire from Nepal. He's a leading practitioner in Nepal. He's consultant, pediatric pulmonology, and intensivist at Kanti Children Hospital in Kathmandu. After completing DM from the prestigious All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, he is presently practicing in the area of pediatric pulmonology and intensive care. He takes particular pleasure in mentoring his junior colleagues. Welcome to the show, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Let me invite Dr. Vijay Kumar first. He will be giving us a broad overview about what is asthma and how to identify if any of our children have asthma. Over to you, Dr. Vijay Kumar. Uh, thank you. A very good morning, everyone. So today I'm going to address a simple question, but however, it's a very important question. So what is asthma and uh, the question of many parents, does my child have it? So the brief overview or the simple overview of my presentation would be, you'll come to know what is asthma and what is the basic problem in the asthma and how to diagnose it and what are the problems that are specific to children in diagnosing the asthma. And also what are the things we look, whether it is favoring asthma or it's against asthma. And can we predict asthma by some indices? And when we have to think beyond asthma, some other con respiratory condition, which is leading to the symptoms. So it, you all know that it is a chronic inflammation, airway inflammation that is occurring, it keeps on occurring in the lower airways, smaller airways. And that lead to symptoms like wheeze, shortness of breath, chest tightness, cough, all these symptoms vary over time. Sometimes they may be present, sometimes they may be absent. And also in intensity, that means sometimes it may be very severely symptomatic, sometimes it may be very mild symptoms are there. Along with, this is the one particular thing that is demonstrated only with the equipments, that is the variable expiratory airflow limitation. So this is the simplified pathogenesis in asthma. So if you see the normal airways, which is wide open and it is the air can move in and out very freely. Whereas if you see the asthmatic airway, it is narrow. The inner diameter is 
very much reduced and also there is swelling and also there is redness so the air cannot move in and out very free if you see the section of the airway then you see there is excessive protection of mucus and also the cells are increased in number and also there is also increase in the inflammatory cells so all together what it causes there will be difficulty or resistant more resistant to the air to move in or to move out the problem is more with the moving out of uh, moving the air away out from the lungs when compared with the moving in in very severe cases there won't be any air which will be moving into the lungs from the atmosphere so what are the typical symptoms of asthma so as i already said the symptoms they vary in intensity that is sometimes you may be very severely symptomatic sometimes you may be very mild having mild symptoms and it vary over times in a month you may be symptomatic for 3 4 days then you will be asymptomatic will be normal and again you will get symptoms so these symptoms especially worse at night and also when you wake up in the morning and the symptoms are also triggered by the allergens like pollen cold air and when you uh, cry or laugh excessively those are the things which can trigger the symptoms these symptoms also worsen with viral infections so how do you make a diagnosis so you have to demonstrate the episodic symptoms that is occurring in the children and it should also be partially at least partially reversible it can be completely reversible also so that is when you are give a drug particular drug bronchodilator it should be reversible and also the other alternate diagnosis should be expert this is very common with the pediatric patients or who are toddlers there are plenty of other diagnosis which can just mimic like asthma so we have to exclude those diagnosis and we have to demonstrate the airway hyper responsiveness which will be very difficult in children and also there are no standard methods or very well established methods to do it in children so they are not very safe this high airway hyper responsiveness may it is a universal feature of asthma however it can occur with some other diseases also say bronchitis or cystic fibrosis which can present in the early childhood those also have airway hyper responsiveness so it is an unresolved issue that is affecting all the ages so why to diagnose it very correctly and particularly asthma is we have to we should we should di diagnose it and we should not miss any other important diagnosis which could explain the respiratory symptoms see a child can present only with the cold that's it that's the only symptom the, the all the four symptoms may not be present and the wheeze that is classically uh, explained as a whistling sound may not be present at all times and the same wheeze can present in other conditions also so we should avoid missing a important diagnosis and also once we diagnose we have to diagnose start the appropriate treatment and also you should avoid unnecessary treatments so we should not treat a cystic fibrosis which is also having hyper responsiveness as asthma and they also will have bees so it similarly there are plenty of conditions which can have the similar thing and if you see the occurrence of under diagnosis in asthma in the population studies in children and adults it is about 7 to 10% so it is a very large number when you take into the population as well as the over diagnosis also much higher that is 30 to 50% of the children over diagnosed as having asthma so if you take a children uh, cohort of 1000 people and if 200 are diagnosed as asthma then you see 60 to 100 people were not having asthma really but they have been diagnosed as asthma because the symptoms is similar to any other condition and we need to narrow down the diagnosis so what are the particular challenges that we face in children these episodic symptoms symptoms which i described earlier that is the cough wheezing uh, chest tightness all those things are common without having asthma also say in the case of some airway if the airway is not properly formed then also you may have intermittent wheezing cough and also difficulty in breathing similarly if something compressing on the airways then again you will have asthma asthma like symptoms but it's not really asthma and the next thing is not able to assess the airflow limitation this is the major drawback with the pediatric age group because in adults we have spirometry we have other investigations to diagnose it whether the say air flow limitation is there or not whether it is reversible or not whereas in case of children it is still we are taking baby steps to to incorporate the pulmonary function test to uh, to the older children as well as to the younger children so that is the major limitation or a major challenge in children to diagnose the asthma and also we are not able to assess the airway hyper responsiveness because 
in adults we can give some medications which can trigger the symptoms which, which are very similar to asthma whereas in children it is uh, the doses are not very well standardized and also it is very it's not very safe or it's not recommended as of now to check the hyper responsiveness in the children so what we have is something called a probability based approach it depends on the symptoms what your child is having suppose if a child is having recurrent in general there are 10 to 12 episodes per year of respiratory tract infection it's normal in children but however we need to look at the duration of the symptoms and also how many episodes these prolonged periods are occurring in a year so if, if children are having less than 10 days of simple upper respiratory tract infection and which are very less frequent that is 2 to 3 episodes per year and they are completely normal in between then out of those children only few have asthma again there are no particular numbers to say it if they are having this kind of symptoms only this many number of children will have asthma that is not there so in other scenario some might have asthma in that case the symptoms generally persist more than 10 days and the episodes are more than 3 episodes per year and they are having severe episodes or night worsening and between the episodes also they may have occasional these and coming to the third category or severe category the symptoms are present more than 10 days every episode and there are more than 3 episodes per year and the episodes sometimes are very severe or there is night worsening and in between the episodes also children are having cough and heavy breathing while playing or laughing and there is also history of some allergic sensitization or some atopic dermatitis say skin skin lesions and food allergy and also there is history of family allergy so if these things are present in a particular child then the risk of having asthma is high again we cannot say a particular number then coming to what are the things that will favor the diagnosis of asthma so one is the your child is having frequent respiratory symptoms second the child remains well relatively well between the episode that is completely normal sometimes he is having symptoms and other times he is well playing and going to school everything is fine and there are particular triggers are present say it may be a viral infection initially start with the upper respiratory tract infection say running nose or something then it progress to something with the breathing difficulty then he recovers after a week or so so it is triggered by the viral infection or by excessive cry, cry or laugh that also cause the child to make they have to have the breathlessness and whenever the season changes say in winters the incidence of asthma increases because the air become more polluted and the dust particle will remain in the atmosphere and thereby they will have increased problems and also when they expose to smoke both indoor smoke outdoor smoke second hand smoking if these trigger symptoms and also the dust mites construction dust molds if these are triggers are present then the likelihood of asthma is more and the symptoms are more in the night or in the morning because the, there will be secretions and it will be clogging the airways and there will be more symptoms that is more uh, favoring towards the asthma again sneezing nasal discharge itching especially early morning sneezing or sneezing whenever they exposed to uh, cold air or dust it indicates again some allergy in the nasal part so when you have nasal allergy it is high likely you might have the allergy in the lung also the second the other thing is response to beta 2 agonist therapy in simple terms many people will give asthma nebulization whenever the child is having some breathlessness and they will become all right so it indicates that again the your bronchus is very small and when you give that particular drug the bronchus is getting dilated and your child is improving so that is also favoring towards asthma and history of eczema it's a type of skin allergy when you have allergy in skin again you have you can have allergy in the nose you can have allergy as well as in the lungs and another thing is your family history any of the family members suffering from asthma allergic rhinitis or atopy what are the things that is going against asthma so if the symptoms started at birth so from birth he is having some breathlessness some cough something is there then it is unlikely to be asthma and the symptoms are sudden onset so generally children with asthma have some respiratory infection or some exposure to some allergens then they have difficulty in breathing whereas if they develop some sudden onset breathlessness it may be due to some foreign body aspiration which might be sudden onset again children will have cough asthma but it is cough and wheezing but it is not asthma and your child is not growing well generally children with asthma say mild to moderate variety they will grow well even though they are having some chronic respiratory problem however if, you, if they have other problems other uh, respiratory problems like and they have some airway malaise or if they have some chronic disease like cystic fibrosis or some bronchiectasis 
they may not grow well they will not gain weight they will not gain height their growth will be less than the what is normal for the age and if there are any signs of defect in the absorption say if the child is having frequent large volume stools foul swelling stools again it indicates some other condition rather than asthma and if there are any feeding difficulties like choking or vomiting then again it indicates some feeding difficulties aspiration is going on it is not asthma of course it can also assist with the asthma that is another thing a symptom change is the position generally doctors with a reflux disease where when you lie down your stomach contents will come into the esophagus that is the food pipe and also it can enter into your wind pipe so that you will have some cough and also sometimes wheezing but again the basic problem is the problem with the lower sphincter esophageal sphincter the reflex and that is causing your breathing problem and persistent rhinitis and ear discharge this is again one of the disease called primary ciliary dyskinesia where you have nasal symptoms ear symptoms as well as lung symptoms but again it is not asthma again if there is a family history of cystic fibrosis or some immune deficiency or some tuberculosis this can also mimic like asthma so whenever these things are present you have to always think beyond asthma and we are you know child is also linked so can we predict asthma there are certain indices like asthma predictive index modified asthma predictive these are the indices which have been developed in the western countries based on the few factors like presence of parental asthma parental eczema blood eosinophil count and food allergy however these indices may be applicable to the particular population may not be applicable to our indian population they they didn't do well in predicting the asthma in other 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 regions like asians or in indian countries and they have poor predictive ability so the problem is the characteristics of the study population is different and also the clinical settings at the age at which we are looking at the outcome that is also different so this prediction is very difficult and also the poor predictive ability is there with the indices available at present so how do we arrive at the diagnosis of asthma after overcoming all these things one is the symptom pattern how the symptoms are present that which i already explained that is variable in intensity as well as type and also you look at the risk factors one is, is the risk factor with the child and also risk factor with the family next is the one more method is response to the controlled treatment when you start treatment give a big trial of 2 to 3 months the inner th therapy then you see the response If the child is improving retrospectively we can make the diagnosis of asthma and you also have to exclude the alternate diagnosis so which i will be dealing in the next slide so what are the alternate diagnosis when we have to think about the alternative diagnosis when you are treating a case of asthma if there is a failure type see the child is having we are treating as a mild asthma but the child is having significant failure type obviously we have to think about some other problem that the child is having and also neonatal onset symptom which i already said like in a primary ciliary dyskinesia or cystic fibrosis they will be symptomatic from the neonatal age and vomiting with the respiratory symptom again this is a reflex continuous wheezing is present continuous wheezing can present in whenever there is a airway obstruction that is a fixed one which is not getting relieved by the your bronchodilators or your inhaled medications and also some other conditions like if the airways are very weak so again failure to respond to the medication again another indication so in this case you have to rule out whether the technique is proper the mother is giving the mother or father is giving the inhaled medication properly you have to rule out these conditions whether a drug is right the dose is right and the technique is right these things you have to see then if the failure is still there then you think of other diagnosis and there are no trigger factors even when the child is exposed to trigger the child is symptomatic not exposed to trigger then also same symptoms are present then again you think of some other diagnosis rather than asthma but during examination if you find any focal sign this is primarily for the physicians if you find some focal signs in one particular region or if you have some additional sound when doing uh, take while doing a cardiac examination then you think of some other diagnosis rather than asthma and again this clubbing that is a swelling of the finger or fingertip or if there is a hypoxia generally unless the case is very severe the asthma children will not have hypoxia that is fall in saturation so if these things are present definitely we have to think about some other diagnosis so the take home messages is very clear it's a heterogeneous disease and all the children who are having wheezing cough are not essentially to be asthma and whenever we treat asthma with inhaled adequate inhaled steroid adequately then they should respond if there is a poor response we should always rule out the alternative diagnosis and avoiding allergens triggers that play that also play important role in the management of asthma 
Although asthma is a clinical diagnosis, the investigations are essential to rule out the alternate diagnosis. Now we we are in the era to have pulmonary function tests even for the preschool age and also from the newborn. Although the newborn pulmonary function tests are not very well established with asthma, may be used for some other conditions. But we can do pulmonary function tests in preschool age. That is anybody who is more than three and half to four years, and we can do spirometry. Any any anybody who is uh, more than six to seven years. So thank you. I want to acknowledge the Department of Internal Pulmonology and Respiratory Medicine at Narvi Hospitals, and also Dr. Jagger, who is my friend and uh, my colleague while doing my uh, DM program. So for accepting the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. Uh, I think one of the startling revelations to me was how the and over diagnosis is uh, at a very high percentage compared to under diagnosis that that was uh, new information for me and i think you already explained some of the things that can be done to you know avoid such over diagnosis i think dr jagat will be elaborating more on that uh, aspect so let me uh, invite dr jagat dr jagat over to you hey, thank you sir uh, so <clears throat> doctor let me uh, sorry to interrupt uh, we we already have few questions coming up so i just want to uh, let all of our viewers know that you can drop whatever questions you have at the chat box and i will be taking those questions with the doctors on your behalf thank you sorry doctor jagat okay sir uh so good morning all today uh, uh, we'll be uh, so, uh, discussing for next maybe 10 to 15 minutes and diagnosis of asthma and uh, uh, in continue in continuum of what uh, dr vj has already started so we will be focusing on how to make the diagnosis of asthma as he said uh, so th this is uh, what we are trying to discuss today why we need to diagnose asthma so how to diagnosis how to make the diagnosis of asthma in preschooler and in children so there are certain pulmonary function tests and many of many of us would feel that these are tests that are aimed to diagnose asthma in adults so uh, let uh, we'll be discussing uh, the feasibility of all these uh, pfts in uh, children uh, who are uh, suspected of having asthma and so this is the slide that we saw earlier as well so why we need to make a diagnosis just to say that over diagnosis and under diagnosis are significant problem in asthma uh, if we uh, look at the global data global burden data from a developing country like ours we are having a great a deal of under diagnosis but uh, if you uh, see uh, the data globally yeah, even in the developed countries uh, because of the lack of the objective diagnostic tool uh, used in day to day practice there is um, a great number of percentages having the over diagnosis of asthma so uh, although we say diagnosis is very very important uh, the there are so many challenges we are having um, as we discussed in the previous session the the symptoms that uh, our kids have be uh, experienced because of asthma are highly non specific and they can occur in other diseases like in having recurrent respiratory tract infection uh, and other certain diagnostic conditions and uh, these kids are not able to do the conventional spirometry that we are doing particularly 6 years uh, more than 5 to 6 years less than 5 to 6 years then able to you know, cooperate with the uh, the the techniques of the spirometry and these all um, because of all these things uh, the diagnosis uh, in preschooler age is very very challenging and moreover there are so many disease in kids um, that are that highly mimic the symptomatology is highly mimicking of the asthma like tracheobronchomalacia cystic fibrosis chronic pulmonary aspiration these are some of the diseases that can have the similar um, clinical presentation like that of asthma so just to show that in pre, uh, if we go to the diagnosis of asthma in preschooler uh, usually uh, the symptom based diagnostic uh, criteria that we are using most that we discussed in the previous slide as well those kids those have more than 10 days of symptoms during upper respiratory infection having more than 3 episodes per year and with some uh, allergic component and they are very very likely to have asthma this kind of kids they uh, although we treat them uh, based on the history and the examination these are the kids 
which uh, we should get uh, we should get tested um, uh, using the various tools we'll be discussing on subsequent slides. So in preschooler, we say we have symptoms like cough, wheezing, shortness of breath. They do have reduced activity and they do have positive family history. There are some of the important clues that can uh, make uh, that can help that can support in making the diagnosis of the asthma. So the diagnosis in under five is the symptom pattern, certain risk factors, and the exclusion of the alternative diagnosis that, that we just discussed. And fourth important thing that we have to see in kids is the response to the controller treatment. If the response to uh, the six six of the inhaled corticosteroids, uh, they're likely that they have asthma. So having the in a, uh, having uh, uh, those kids who have typical symptom, which we have excluded alternative diagnosis, and they do have response to the controller treatment, they are very very likely to have asthma. So this is very important slide in when we diagnose uh, suspect asthma in under five kids, uh, looking for the anth anthropometry for failure to thrive, uh, clubbing, looking for organomegaly, and ass assessing for the other uh, central nervous system abnormalities. These are very, very important because diagnosing asthma in under five, we should be ruling out alternate diagnosis before getting any tests done. So if we look at the uh, diagnosis of asthma in children, we have typical symptoms that we discussed earlier, and we have certain findings on the clinical examination. So let's see what are the different tests that we can do in our kids when you have uh, when you um, uh, to make the diagnosis of the asthma. So these are the some of the tests. So these are the lung function tests, spirometry that we have been doing for quite a long and especially used in adult patient. Spirometry can be done in children five years or um, older. And there are certain techniques which may be different than adults, but it is now well accepted that spirometry is not a very difficult thing to do in kids. And we can do spirometry in five years or older kids. Second set of investigations are the uh, impulse oscillometry or false force oscillation oscillometric techniques. Then we have Excel nitric oxide, we have tests for allergic sensitization. Many of the tests doing the X-ray um, is also important. It is particularly to rule out the other alternate diagnosis that closely mimic asthma. So uh, spirometry is, uh, we are not going into the details of the spirometry, but uh, this is how spirometry done in kids. Uh, we can assess uh, the different components, different uh, parameters like for FEB1 is a parameter that is very, very important. FEB1, decreased FEB1 with reduced FEB1 by forced vital capacity ratio is a very, very uh, important marker of the air flow limitation. And then uh, when you document that there is expiratory flow limitation, we check for the reversibility in these uh, children by the use of uh, the bronchodilator, that is the salbutamol, and reassessing for all these parameters. And if there is increment in this parameter by some percentage, uh, usually the diagnosis of asthma is made. And this is said, this the first component is the demonstration of the expiratory airflow limitation. And second component is the reversibility, which in earlier session, uh, as Dr. Bizet explained, are the hallmark of uh, the diagnostic criteria for asthma. So just to summarize, we have expiratory flow limitation by using the spirometry, FEB1 is reduced. And uh, then we say for the positive bronchodilator response, that is by increasing the FEB1 of more than 12% of the predicted in children. So these two, uh, these two uh, this, uh, steps are very uh, crucial in making the diagnosis of the asthma. A patient who has typical symptom of asthma, but even has FEB1 very uh, normal, and if the bronchodilator uh, response is not positive, we may have to consider looking for the alternate diagnosis. And this uh, doing a spirometry, looking for the airflow limitation, and followed by um, this reversibility is very, very important uh, component of uh, objectively diagnosing asthma in children. So we can see that uh, we did a spirometry uh, baseline. We uh, we we uh, used bronchodilator, then reassessed there, and there is some increase in the. We can see this is the pre and the, this is the post, 
and they have um, certain increment by, by certain percentage and that we say there was expiratory flow limitation and there is reversibility hence the diagnosis of the asthma uh, in a patient who have symptoms is made. So this, uh, this highlights the role of the spirometry in diagnosis of the asthma. So next important uh, tool that we have been using for quite long is the PEFR. PEFR, we know the peak expiratory flow uh, flow rate that we can using you can use uh, by using this PEFR. Uh, this is very simple tool where the child excels against the full of his uh, ability and just uh, just uh, we can record how what is the there are different amounts for different ages and by using pfr also we are doing the reversibility is doing the back baseline pfr then giving some um, this bronchodilator then reassessing for the pfr if there is increment by 20 percent is then we say uh, there is a reversibility. So although this concept is uh, recently uh, not uh, like kind of uh, the, it should be, it should not be replacing the spirometry is something that uh, the recommendation uh, from the expert panel, but uh, in the lack of the spirometry in many parts of the world and the lack of the uh, enough uh, technician that can make the child do spirometry in the most acceptable way, PFR can be used to establish the uh, reversibility uh, to and to make hence to make the diagnosis of the asthma so next uh, investigation that is not very commonly done but very, can be a very important tool to objectively uh, make the diagnosis of asthma is the impulse oscillometry or the forced oscillometry you can see uh, the airway has a um, certain degrees of the resistance uh, like bigger uh, airway uh, <clears throat> have certain resistance and the smaller ear we have certain resistance if we have we have two terminologies resistant at 5 hertz and resistant at 20 hertz resistant at 20 hertz represent the resistance at the bigger airway and the resistance at 5 hertz represent the total uh, resistance and if we look the difference between the r5 and the r20 is the resistance in the small airways and this is something which is uh, reflected in asthmatic patient that means asthmatic patient will have a very high uh, resistance in um, uh, resistance of the smaller uh, airways and similarly even in this using this, this test we can um, uh, objectively uh, look for the two things one is the demonstration of the air flow limitation by documenting the resistance and next uh, is a uh, documentation of the reversibility by uh, looking for the decrease in the resistance after giving some bronchodilator. So in, in small kids who are not able to perform the spirometry well, we can use uh, this impulse or force oscillometry to assess for both the air flow limitation and the reversibility. And this can be a very, very important tool to make the diagnosis of the asthma, uh, especially in small kids. So just to show that this is how it is done, we can see we have R5, R20, and uh, if there is decrement, decrease, decrease, uh, decrease, decrease of the resistance by certain percentage, uh, we say this is the likelihood of the reversibility present and hence diagnosis of the asthma. So third investigation that uh, we are having in current days is the pheno. Uh, we know that whenever there is inflammation in the airway, there will be expression of the NOS enzyme and uh, there will be increased NO level in the airway. And uh, this can, um, this has been demonstrated that uh, the, uh, the level of the pheno in the airway uh, can be an imp uh, important tool to make the diagnosis of the asthma. And this has been currently recommended like a patient who have classic symptoms asthma, but they lack reversibility by using spirometry they do go with the pheno testing and having a pheno elevated uh, by certain level uh, helps in making the diagnosis of the asthma this can also not only well help in the diagnosis of the asthma but it can also assess the response to the anti-inflammatory drug that we are giving and third important uh, utility of pheno is when a patient has with oil control asthma for three to six months, then when you consider stepping down on the inhaled, uh, um, this anti-inflammatory medication, we can 
we can uh, take the help of the pheno to guide uh, the tapering of the inel corticosteroid so these are this is going to be a very very useful tool to make the diagnosis of the asthma because uh, the technique the child has to learn is very very simple and uh, it can be used to monitor the treatment response and all so uh, just to summarize our uh, value of uh, more than 35 is very, is certainly high in children and less than 20 is normal in children and 20 to 35 is something we have to interpret with uh, caution and uh, uh, when you start inhale corticosteroid and the pheno has decreased by more than 20 percent uh, it's something that's that uh, signifies that um, the child is responding to the anti-inflammatory therapy so in our days to come Pheno is likely to bring a lot of change in the management of the asthma and diagnosis of asthma. So to conclude that, uh, we have to objectively make the diagnosis of the asthma as far as possible because uh, there are so many issues with under and the over diagnosis of asthma. Although history and the examination play a vital role in the diagnosis, demonstration of the expiratory flow limitation and reversibility are important hallmark in the making the diagnosis of the asthma which can be done by using the spirometry in bigger kids and by using the impulse oscillometry and the FOT in small kids and uh, the pheno is likely uh, to make help in the diagnosis of the asthma because of uh, the utility or the ease of doing the test and uh, uh, maybe the uh, uh, the availability uh, in across all the major cities in the days to come so with these slides i'd like to uh, end my presentation and i'd like to once again uh, thank for uh, uh, the the opportunity that uh, I, I got today to talk in front of you all and any question and question and queries i would be happy to answer in the q a section part thank you sir thank you Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jagat. Thank you for clearly explaining various diagnosis, uh, diagnostic techniques available to get the uh, diagnosis of asthma right. I mean, it is very important to get the diagnosis right and uh, to be followed uh, with adequate, uh, appropriate treatment measures. But the best thing that one can do is to prevent, uh, uh, take preventive measures to get asthma. And that is the aspect that Dr. Sonia will be focusing on today. So let me invite Dr. Sonia to uh, enlighten us on the preventive measures that can be taken to avoid asthma. Over to you, Doctor. Uh, thank you. Um, Dr. Vijay Kumar and Dr. Jagat have spoken. Can you see my uh, screen? Yes, Doctor. Uh, so they've spoken about how to diagnose asthma and uh, what is asthma. Now I will try to talk about can we prevent asthma and once we have asthma, how well we can control our symptoms. So I will try to talk about levels of prevention, what are the risk factors, primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention of asthma. So what we mean by these levels of prevention, uh, prevention we can, can start in, in utero when mother is pregnant. So that is like primordial prevention when the, uh, there is no disease. Once the disease uh, is there, how to manage risks and prevent asthma from starting. And once the disease, once you're diagnosed with asthma, how to uh, ensure early diagnosis and prompt treatment and how to reduce the complications. So in utero, when the mother is pregnant, uh, there are things which can be done to uh, prevent uh, asthma. One is the mother should have good nutrition, a varied healthy nutrition, a balanced diet. Uh, then she should uh, not be exposed to too many microbes, infections. Uh, also, inhaled oxidants, so uh, tobacco smoking, uh, any type of uh, different air pollutions and chemicals, all these are harmful for the growing child. Uh, the mother's uh, weight gain, she should have a healthy weight gain, healthy lifestyle, and not increase weight quite uh, fast and he eat healthy. She should avoid uh, medications like antibiotics and paracetamol, if possible, because these have also been shown to affect the baby. And she should be also not have too much stress. She should be happy, positive state of mind. And all these help for the baby to grow healthy. Uh, so as I said, the maternal diet should include all uh, types of food, uh, milk, nuts, fish, everything should, whatever she can eat, uh, depending on her, uh, what she enjoys eating, she should try to take. She should avoid uh, becoming uh, obese or quick weight gain. Uh, 
if she is vitamin D deficient during the antenatal, during checkups, if the vitamin D is low, then it should definitely be corrected because this is an important factor to prevent uh, childhood asthma. Uh, vitamin D can be corrected through the diet, through supplements and also good sunlight exposure. Other supplements which help or which comes in a balanced diet include vitamin E, vitamin C, zinc and fish which has uh, healthy omega-3 fatty acids and probiotics. So this is a balanced diet which helps. Again, we said smoking. So smoking can be from tobacco smoke uh, and also from traffic, from diesel, from fumes. So all these, if they're inhaled during pregnancy, it can affect the growth of the baby in various ways. There is something called epigenetics. So the genetic makeup may be affected and the child uh, will have changes which will make them more prone for asthma later on. There are inflammatory responses in the cells and also the placenta may be affected because of this. And this will finally lead on to uh, growth ret retardation. The baby may not grow to its full potential. The baby will have low birth weight, premature birth, and also other problems like asthma. So uh, a small baby may have risks such as genetics. There may be a strong family history of asthma or other allergic disorders. Uh, again, the baby, once the baby is born, that baby also could be exposed to the smoke and tobacco smoke or other allergens, uh, proteins, other allergens the baby may breathe in. And also certain infections may uh, make the child more prone to developing these. And definitely air pollution uh, also is an important factor. And as the child becomes uh, grows up, um, stress and the different parts of their uh, growth, uh, again, occupational exposure, obesity, those children who are obese, they are also maybe more prone for asthma. And uh, again, this is called atopic march. So allergies, allergies in the family, they may start at young age uh, as food allergies. They may not tolerate certain foods, uh, cow's milk or uh, nuts, different food allergies uh, and also skin problems like atopic dermatitis, eczema. So initially it may start like this and these children, if they're not well controlled, then these allergies may progress to allergic rhinitis, which is like uh, uh, rubbing the nose, uh, sneezing, uh, rubbing the eyes, allergic rhinitis and allergic asthma. So whatever allergies are there, they should be early diagnosed and treated, controlled well, and this may prevent the progression of this atopic march. This is about the food allergy, the foods which can worsen their food allergies include eggs, soy, selfish, uh, shellfish, wheat, fish, milk, and nuts. Again, once uh, baby is born, baby is growing, uh, child is well, these are asthma triggers, the inhaled allergen. So even within a house, there are so many triggers. Uh, the inside the house, suppose there are uh, pets in the house, those pets' hair can be a trigger, dogs and cats. The, wall, the house itself, uh, if it is uh, not ventilated well, uh, there will be uh, cold dampness, molds. So those those fungal uh, spores which are inhaled, that can uh, predispose to asthma and it's uh, worsening symptoms. Uh, other smokes, like smoking at home or smoke from the chimney or uh, cooking gas, all different uh, for fragrances, the carpet, uh, different things can uh, affect uh, and increase the wheezing. Certain climate changes, uh, diesel, suppose there's a traffic outside, the diesel fumes, there's a factory, the factory fumes, all these can uh, trigger asthma. So air pollution, indoor aeroallergens like house dust mites and smoke. House dust mites are found in the mattresses and pillows. So as the child lies on that and breathes, those things will uh, trigger the asthma. Cold air, dampness, uh, pets and infections. So some children, when the flu comes, the cold comes, viral poles, these can... Uh, move on to asthma. So what we have seen is like a child who is uh, supposed to grown up in a farm, they are uh, in a nature, they're with nature, they're uh, having uh, just normal food, they're exposed to certain normal common childhood infections. They have a, a diverse microbe in their uh, system and they, are, they develop tolerance to certain infections. They have a good immune balance and they grow up healthy. But now in our uh, modern cities, uh, we have a more westernized diet. So our diet doesn't have certain uh, food items. We may just have more of wheat items, more of uh, certain items. So, so our body doesn't have that diversity of the food. And we are uh, exposed to different pollutions and environmental uh, factors which uh, 
again will cause inflammation in our body. And again, certain viruses all cause inflammation. And these also, our immunity is disturbed and they can cause asthma and allergies. So, sorry, primary prevention. So, uh, we have to, for a child, there should be a positive supportive environment. So, there should be good air. A uh, child should be allowed to play in a place. So they should have avoid the child's exposure to environmental tobacco smoke. Uh, during pregnancy, identification and correction of vitamin D deficiency in a woman planning pregnancy. And the child, uh, this was uh, encouraged vaginal delivery, advised breastfeeding, and also discourage the use of broad spectrum antibiotics during the first year of life. All this will help to prevent atopia and allergies and asthma. Uh, again, delayed introduction. So breastfeeding should be continued up to six months. And also uh, the milk should be farm fresh milk. Once the asthma is diagnosed or if there is a strong family history of an allergic disease, atopic dermatitis, eczema, wrong, there is any allergic uh, like blood eosinophilia or raised IgE, these children should be screened if they have asthma. Early diagnosis and early management is uh, helpful in preventing worsening of asthma symptoms. So they have to come for periodic once in three months or as advised by the doctor, periodic health examinations and even public health initiatives. So the government should provide fresh air, parks, places for children to play and uh, try to reduce the pollution. Inside the house, we were saying about uh, uh, house dust mites and cockroaches and animals. All these also can be controlled. So suppose there is, um, suppose we are talking, even cockroaches are known to, those type of proteins released from that can cause more allergies. So those uh, rodent control pesticides, all those can be used. If we are talking about animals at home, uh, they should not be allowed to enter the bedroom because the animal hair can trigger an asthma. And also there are things called HEPA filters. So these are air filters which can help uh, to reduce the uh, pollutant from breathing, the child can less uh, air with pollutants can be breathed in by using HEPA filters, HEPA filters in vacuum cleaners to clean the house. House dust mite. House dust mite is something which we cannot see. It is found in uh, bedding covers. So that warm, hot water when using laundering this uh, clothes, humidity control. Too much humidity will also increase this house dust mite. So humidity control. If there are carpets and upholstered furniture they, and soft toys, all these are these dust mites will grow in them. So you should try to avoid those. Um, even the um, the uh, you should remove the mold from the hard surfaces on the walls, and all these molds are also very a uh, trigger for asthma. And uh, you should have good ventilation systems and repair any uh, leaking pipe. Uh, again, all these pest controls can be. Uh, are helpful in reducing the uh, frequency of asthma attacks once it's diagnosed. So once we, are, we have a diagnosis of asthma, uh, we want the child to live as uh, normal and uh, the child can do that. That is with correct treatment and uh, follow-up and prevention of exacerbations. So there are treatments available. So as I said, uh, allergies, other allergies like allergic rhinitis, all these have to be con uh, controlled. So uh, an anti-allergic medicines for uh, antihistamines, um, inhaled steroids, inhaled bronchodilators, all these should be prescribed by the doctor. All these have to be taken. And if the symptoms are under control, the child can go to school, play, do anything they want. But if the symptoms are not controlled, they will be sick most of the time and miss a lot of school. Even the environment where the child is staying or uh, this all have to be controlled and the triggers have to be controlled. Vaccinations, the child should take the, all the routine immunizations and flu vaccines and other pneumococcal vaccines. So these are also help to prevent infections and then worsening of asthma symptoms. Asthma medication should be taken as prescribed. Uh, an asthma action plan. So you will know how to Treat the asthma with all the medications you have so that uh, things are controlled well at home. Regular follow-up. And if the asthma is not controlled by all this, there is allergen-specific immunotherapy. So that's it. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Doctor. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. We have about uh, eight minutes left and we have a few questions coming up from the uh, viewers. 
we will take them first and if time for permits we can have few more questions so uh, some questions are related to treatment options but let me start with some questions related to uh, preventive measures uh, um, dr sonia perhaps you can answer this question a person has asked is asthma hereditary i think you already touched upon it in your presentation but if you can elaborate a bit more uh, the person has also asked if there is any relationship between blood group and asthma so asthma like if there's a strong strong family history of allergies like i told you allergic rhinitis the no symptoms uh, the child there is a chance the child can have asthma especially if there's a family history of strong family history of asthma but uh, there are protective factors which i discussed and even if the child is diagnosed there is lots of medicines which are easily we can manage at home uh, blood group is not a factor uh, it is more uh, yeah. even there is no genetic with the uh, modern pollution and all there are more cases even without genetics right right so the environmental factors are uh, providing a higher risk than the genetic uh, factors right yes yes correct right. thank you dr uh, Uh, just just to uh, if you can answer this other question as well uh, it has something to do with exercises and yoga i think the person is uh, intending to ask what kind of exercises and yoga can be done to beat asthma are there any specific types of exercises that you would recommend uh, well exercises one is uh, a child who is healthy as i said obesity and uh, unhealthy lifestyle sitting at home all the time all these uh, don't help with asthma so uh, generally exercise is good uh, an active life uh, is good uh, any exercise that helps to open up the airways keeping the nose clear uh, open up the airways those all help there is like i can't say any specific exercise all exercises have their benefits so right. an active child uh, with asthma control can do any exercise and be normal right. as any other right. right. mr konvasan right. can i add right. something right. Yes, yes, please, doctor. Vijay. So, as of now, uh, when we talk about the, any exercise, yoga, or uh, something like that for the treatment of asthma, at present, whatever the evidence we have, whatever the studies we have, it is not the standard of care. Right. So, it is not only the care that should be given to asthmatic patients. So, it can be as some added up care along with other medications. So, that is the first point. So, it is not the standard of care, but it can be used. Say, yoga has some uh, posture exercises. as well as has some breathing exercises and also meditation so there are two or three things in yoga that that can be done so right. the basic principle is say whenever the child is having asthma adult is having asthma they will be breathing more basically they are hyperventilating and they right. are making the air more air getting obstructed into the airways as well as into the lung so right. what asthma does, what, what does the breathing exercise does so it makes you breathe very deep and also very slow and also it makes you to exhale all the air outside uh, from the lungs to the atmosphere so basically it opposite to the patho patho pathophysiology of asthma right. so it might help in which cases there is mild and moderate asthma there may be some help whatever studies done in adults and children you know how it is very difficult to make them to do asthma in a 3 year old child or 4 year old child to make the specific things it is very difficult right. but if the children are trainable of course we can use it mild and moderate varieties uh, there is no data on severe varieties so these are the things some subjective things whatever observed in adults like their quality of life has somewhat improved and uh, their amount of inhaled medications may be reduced somewhat and when you see the investigations so whatever we do some exercise we do we, uh, do some intervention we measure it with the objective measurement so when we do the lung function right. say uh, we, uh, we do in asthma patients so there is no significant difference between those who had uh, exercise or those who don't have the exercise had the exercise mm -hmm. so that is another part so of course there is some improvement in quality of life as well as the amount of medications they are using right. Right. but it cannot be recommended as a standard of care right. absolutely thank you thank you for clarifying that doctor uh, dr jagat perhaps uh, you can answer this question uh, there is a question from dr R. or ramakrishnan he has of course appreciated the presentation uh he has asked couple of questions one is about uh, asthma leads to so many additional complications he says uh, which can be pneumonia pulmonary and complicated diseases and so on let me know the reasons for this and he also wants to know of course asthma is a chronic disease but is it possible to cure it completely at some point dr jagat can you answer that uh, 
so asthma uh, like uh, asthma when you do not treat asthma uh, so what really happens is the child keeps on having these acute symptoms and getting a frequent symptoms the child uh, will fail to grow and particularly severe variety of the asthmatic children uh, they're not uh, likely to grow with their uh, compared to their uh, other uh, friends of similar age and all so one important thing is that next important thing is that when you do not treat asthma it's very likely that one of the episodes of the asthma may be severe they may land up in the emergency or at times in the icu so these are the important um, uh, uh, things that can happen and so that warrant the cases of the treatment of the asthma next thing is that having asthma doesn't exactly increase the risk of uh, pneumonia but it is well perceived that many of those episodes of asthma have been perceived as a, a pneumonia and have been treated as an a pneumonia in the past multiple times and that that happens right? like it's a it's a recent thing that we have started to learn about asthma and we have accepted to know about the asthma we have and and, and we have accepted to treat uh, take the inhaled medication for asthma but at times when the asthma is not very well controlled and is for very very quite long time uh, we may have certain uh, features like having uh, uh, this uh, bronchopulmonary aspergillosis that we call avp that can mimic pneumonia and uh, many of the times they, they may land up having a chronic hypoxia leading to pulmonary hypertension and all but um, having asthma doesn't increase the uh, risk of uh, pneumonia but uh, we can say that many of the episodes of asthma most likely were treated as case of the uh, pneumonia i think this was the first question and um, what was the second question i'm, I'm I mean, uh, it's, it's about, <clears throat> we know that asthma is chronic but uh, the, the... the viewer has asked is, is there a way to cure it completely okay asthma as we studied uh, the whole uh, the the pathophysiology and all so it's a complex interplay between the genetic factor environmental factor and as uh, sonia ma'am she described the role of epigenomics uh, in the pathophysiology of the asthma uh, like asthma is like a disease like hypertension like diabetes that we have to control by various measure as you discussed the primary prevention secondary prevention uh, by taking the regular use of the medication it's a disease that we control and uh, the the genetic thing that is happening uh, at the genetic level and all that cannot be cured but this is very good that the treatment of the asthma all the patient who have as asthma do not need treatment a uh, long term treatment those who have the frequent uh, episodes or they have a severe episode uh, they uh, require treatment and giving the treatment for um 3 to 6 month most of the kids they get control of their symptoms for quite a long and particularly for under 5 weezer for preschoolers usually uh few of the cohort many of the children uh, they 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 try to outgrow the symptoms of the asthma as they reach the age of uh, the 5 to 6 year but if we say overall regarding the asthma uh, it's it's a disease that we have to um, we have to take a control of the disease like hypertension and diabetes rather than the complete cure of the disease right right thank okay. you thank, thank you doctor you. we are uh, running out of time but maybe we'll take a couple of more questions that have come up Uh, there are two questions from uh, Paran, uh, one uh, parandaman jayganeshan and uh, raja nagarajan i'm going to combine their questions uh, because i can see a common thread in both their questions uh, parandaman jayganeshan has asked about uh, his sister who was diagnosed with asthma as a kid and she is now uh, 36 years old and uh, the viewer wants to know is there any way to check the progression of the disease can it be cured is it is life from treatment viable and safe what are the side effects etc and raja nagarajan has asked inhalers or hab habit habit forming for toddlers toddlers is it safe and i think this is a common question we get in all the discussions about asthma about uh, the, you know the apprehensions around uh, using inhalers uh, dr uh, vijay kumar would you like to take these questions yeah sure Yeah. So first thing is, uh, I read the questions myself. So right. first thing is, uh, what should be done once a kid is or adult is diagnosed with asthma? So once it is diagnosed, 
we have to see the severity what is the, what is the severity and based on the severity we have to start some treatment so it is the, with the controller as well as symptom reliever so that is one thing second thing is how to check the progression of the disease first thing is we you go back and see the diagnosis whether it is correctly made or not second is what are the things to check the progression and we also see how the drug has been prescribed is it at right level and you are taking it uh, appropriately those things we need to check third is you do the lung function test which is very easy in a uh, adult population that is we have spirometry to do it and also those who are not able to do spirometry we can do post oscillometry test so we can see whether there is a lung function is deteriorating or not maybe i i am not aware of the adult recommendation maybe in children it may be done uh, yearly once and so lifelong treatment so most of the patients will not require life lifelong, lifelong treatment but when you are not treating appropriately with the appropriate dose and technique there will be permanent changes in the airways that may lead to the lifelong treatment and when the medications are appropriate and good symptom control is there you can live as normal as any other any other person right so cure as already explained by dr jagat so that is we have to control the disease right and Thank another you. last question is the habitual farming in toddlers is it safe yeah. or not so when we see compare the inhaled steroids corticosteroids or oral steroids or uh, the nebulization steroid the doses are pretty much higher when we take it as oral or iv something like that or yeah, my nebulization but when you take it as inhaler it's only micrograms that is also majority of the drug is deposited into the lungs so the side effects are very minimal maybe some drug may be deposited in the mouth that we usually advise to wash their mouth once they are uh, once they use the inhalers so the side effects are very minimal and they are very safe suppose if you take a drug through oral route then it will go to the blood stream it will go to the all the organs whatever drug you are taking the effect of the drug will be reflected in all the organs whereas if you through a taken to the inhaled route then it will particularly go to the lungs and it acts where it has to act thank you so thank you so much doctor maybe you can take uh, another uh, two questions that have come up from the viewers and then i will have a final question for for dr sonia and probably we can wrap up the discussion with that um sora blonker has asked how to clear seasonal asthma i think uh, we have covered that in uh, detail through the presentation but uh, the viewer also wants to know what is pyrometry if we can explain that mm-hmm. and since you mentioned corticosteroids uh, in your previous answer there is a question from manivel and rajamanikam as well uh, i don't know how far his assumption is true he has mentioned that corticosteroids are prescribed only uh, by doctors doing private practice and not in government hospitals any input in this regard i think his concern comes from the fact that it's safe to use corticosteroids because uh, he is of the view that it is not prescribed by government doctors would you like to clarify that doctor yeah yeah see uh, i say i worked in a government setup for a more than 9 year, almost 9 years right. so we do prescribe uh, inhaled medications okay and uh, we see the response and if response is there we'll continue if not there we'll stop it so it's not something like government doctors not so for simple cough and uri nobody will prescribe inhalers it's okay. only when you require say the cough i said it's persisting for more than 10 days and if you have breathing difficulty see out of 100 if they have 100 children they are coming to opd with simple uri nobody will prescribe for them out of 100 maybe one or two or 10 maximum 10 might have the breathing problem uh, those require mdi inhalers so that is the difference uh, so that that might answer their question right uh, next one is so what is spirometry uh, so spirometry has uh, jagat uh, yeah. rightly explained uh, during his presentation yeah. it's a simple test like uh, we can do any children more than 6 years or sometimes 6 year children also we can train them to do it's a sim- simple test to measure your lung function whether there is a uh, the air flow limitation which we were mentioning the path path genetic mechanism in the asthma that is there or not that we can measure and also how normally the lung your lungs are functioning and also if you are giving some drug that is the asthma medication whether your problem will resolve or not that also we can check so that is the one test so it can be done in adults it can be done in children now we are doing in a preschool children also right thank you thank you doctor uh, dr sonia I'll, i'll ask you a final question that perhaps i hope that you can give us a message that can be the you know take home uh, message from this discussion like assuming that if a child gets diagnosed with asthma 
will it will it ever outgrow asthma and can the child need to have a normal adulthood and normal life considering all the treatment options available what needs to be done for that doctor any child with asthma can live a normal life but it is controlling we have to use the medicines for as advised we have to prevent uh, asthma from becoming worse by uh, control take the medications and environmental factors so as long as we are exposed suppose we are taking medicines but the environmental factors are still there then the symptoms will continue so our aim of treatment is the child should uh, live normally grow normally and at uh, and do whatever and any other child uh, does in a so asthma can be controlled but it's education the parents and the child both need to understand that this is a problem which can be controlled it may even go depends on how well they are treated but inside the symptom will be there it will come back when there is a trigger or some stress so asthma can be treated well uh, they have to understand they they should not feel that there is something the medicines are bad they should understand why it's been taken and then they can also there should be an asthma action plan they should know why it is taken and they themselves will have more control over their problem and then they will realize that child can grow normally but needs to understand and educate and things are things will go well hi right. thank you that's a wonderful way to summarize the whole discussion i believe doctor thank you thank so you. much for that Thank you, Dr. Vijay Kumar, Dr. Jagat, and Dr. Sonia for joining us today. Thank you, all our viewers and all the all those who asked questions. I hope uh, the the message that you received from doctors were helpful. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay.